How's it going? Doing really well. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, excited to to chat. It's holiday break, so kudos to us for uh, for doing a podcast. Oh my goodness, I am so grateful. Thank you so much for <laughs> between between Christmas and New Year's. Like it, that's such a big deal, and I know that you're <laughs> off somewhere in the world, and so you know I really appreciate you taking time when you could be probably by a pool or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be by a pool in like an hour, so I figure okay. I can uh, cool, cool. take take an hour. To, to wait for that to happen. Incredible. Well, I'm really excited to speak to you because, well, the first thing that got me really excited was I'll just kind of go back to when I first encountered you, I guess, which was on Twitter, <laughs> of course. Um, and so you're JMJ on Twitter. And uh, I was in a Twitter space and Mike from Rainbow was talking and you dropped in and, um, and, we were talking about ENS and ENS names and Mike mentioned that he had JMJ underneath. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I know that Mike is a white hat squatter, which means he's essentially an <laughs> ENS fairy. Um, but I, he was making you sweat for a minute and I was just like, oh my goodness, this is like, this is where we <laughs> definitely want JMJ on the ENS team. <laughs> but yeah. What was that like? Um, and uh, wait, stop. We can get into the ENS stuff, but that was kind of just like my first experience of coming across <laughs> you and and I'm glad that you have the dot eighth name now. Uh, <laughs> and so yeah, that that's kind of like the start of my ENS exposure to you. And then you've gone on to be really, really involved and um, another little story I'll just tell quickly was I know that when we started the DAO, um, we had like a few conversations going in the governance forum and I remember I don't know. It must have been like within the first couple of days and you posted, you like replied to a thread and I know you're in America and I was like, this is a really crazy time. I like quickly Googled and I was just like, this is really wild. It's either like 1am or 4am <laughs> for JMJ, for Jeff. <laughs> that and is hilarious. It's so much commitment and I was just like, wow, he's really pumped about the ENS DAO. It was really exciting for me. So <laughs> I'm excited to kind of get into that stuff. But maybe we could start with kind of like where you're at, what you do day to day, because chapter one is also something that's very, very exciting. And I think completely embodies like everything that is exceptional and exciting about Web3. And I think, you know, just would love to hear you talk about what you're thinking with chapter one and what you do. Totally. Uh, well, thank you for that warm introduction. <laughs> um, and we can talk about the mic story at some point because it's pretty funny, but uh, <laughs> And, and I'll tell you, I do wake up at weird hours um, and okay. I'm, I'm like, yeah, I, I've just had sleeping things my whole life and I wake up and participate on ENS at weird hours. So I'm happy to do that. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I started chapter one, um, I guess I was at Tinder in 2000, from 2015 to 2019 and probably in like 2016, I really started to invest in crypto um, and started something called, it was chapter one, it was just a LLC, it was like myself as a solo GP, but had a, a fund um, that was just a scout fund, it was index ventures, and I called it page zero, because it wasn't really, like, all my funds are page numbers, mm -hmm. and page zero, it like wasn't even a real venture fund, but um, it was my first kind of pool of capital, and I dedicated it um, entirely to crypto, and so I ended up investing in um, projects like the Graph, um, uh, Fleek, um, the Cedar on Compound Finance, Dapper Labs, and kind of all these really cool projects. But um, I ended up starting Chapter One and Page One, the first fund, uh, was started at a time when um, crypto just wasn't really an attractive uh, pitch to LPs. And so I didn't have um, enough like performance or, or kind of like credibility to go raise a pure crypto fund. And so I called mm -hmm. page page one was just like a, uh, a generalist fund, but we ended up investing um, uh, a large amount of it into Web3 and crypto. And so um, I guess like looking forward to page two, which we just announced recently, um, we just decided it was like a, a very uh, uh, long process of figuring out what we want to do with chapter one, but um, we kind of see our place in the ecosystem as being really like product people, designers, um, uh, people who love kind of like the nitty gritty of, of figuring out hard UX and UI challenges. And um, 
we want to make a fund that was dedicated to 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 making Web three more user friendly and delightful and easy um, because our goal ultimately is just to enable as many people to participate in crypto as possible. And right now, I think we take for granted that um, you know there's billions of of users on the internet every day, and um, uh, only a small kind of. I, I read the latest. Um, and this is like an optimistic metric. It's like 200 million people have interacted with crypto in any form, um, 200 million. And so that's a really small number of total internet users. Wow. And that's we, really uh, tiny. Like crypto, <laughs> if, like the whole ecosystem, like, wow. Yeah. And then you look at, um, even you look at OpenSea, like you look at the metrics and it's pretty shocking how much value is being created with just a small subset of internet mm-hmm. users. And, um, we think that's exciting from like a uh, like a market size potential in terms of like this much value is being created with this few users. But we also think there's um, just a large percentage of people who can't use Web3 or crypto yet. And that's like on a basic human level, that, that's like feels kind of wrong, right? And unfortunate mm-hmm. that um, there's like this huge population of um, early adopters. It's not huge. It's, it's actually like pretty small who are who are kind of like creating all the, or I guess like, like capturing all the value right now. Um, and so we really want everyone to, to have access and part of it's usability. So making better products, P- part of it's just education, which I think yeah. is, um, this podcast has been awesome. I think what ENS does with spaces is so awesome because it's like, mm-hmm. um, uh, and part of what I guess drew me into ENS is, uh, you know, I believe that foundationally you need some form of identity on the internet to, um, to create, I guess, like mass market social products. And it doesn't need to be your real identity. Like it can be um, really any identity, but you need to have um, some identity to, to enable things as simple as communication, mm-hmm. um, obviously reputation, um, portable profiles, like all these things that you think about every day, I think are foundational to um, Web3 adoption. And so I just got really excited about ENS from a, a just kind of like, uh, hey, like the world needs this to to kind of like enable mass market um, participation in, in, in Web3. Yeah, that's, I am really excited. The way that I think that ENS is kind of um, as a base layer for, you know, whatever we're building in terms of the next internet and that, you know, a lot of the projects and protocols that you're invested in with um, Chapter One will hopefully use and integrate ENS um, just because it's so fundamental, right? You, It's funny, I feel like I didn't, just like the I, the concept of money, I didn't really have a concept, like a, a, I really didn't have enough concept, context for this concept of identity because we're yeah. so, it's like handled for us, it's so prescriptive and it's really, you know, well-defined within specific parameters that suit specific platforms or, you know, organizations or corporations. And so it didn't really dawn on me that at any point in time I could like have, I guess, like sovereignty over my identity. And now since I've been on Web3, uh, yeah, I've really leaned into it and I really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just, what's so funny is I think it's just the beginning because it's just like me like leveling up my Web2 identity. But I don't yeah. even think that we've kind of scratched the surface of what is a, like a, a truly like crypto native identity. I know some people are doing that on Twitter, you see, and it's, you know, it, it makes it a lot, the space a lot of fun. I know there are risks and trade-offs in that as well, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of really excited about the potential of identity. So I wonder in terms of chapter one, I know there is lots of discussion at the moment about VCs and um, especially in Web3 now, I mean, it must be so interesting for you having invested in 2016 yeah. where you're like, Um, Did you feel, not crazy, but when you're that early and you kind of, are you just waiting for people like your LPs to catch up in terms of how they see the space um, so that they're okay with the investments that you're making in Web3? Or are you waiting for the space to mature? Like what kind of goes through your head in terms of the timing of those investments? Yeah, I mean, part of it is VCs kind of um, sit in the middle of like this financial marketplace, which is limited partners who want to, um, I guess, like invest in you to go find the best founders and companies. Um, and then obviously you need on the other side to have some access to, to founders. And the 
I guess the reality of starting any business is you need to um, to have a product that people really want to invest in. Um, and the same for chapter one, I guess, at the time when I was raising my first fund, um, even though we had invested in the seed rounds of Dapper and Compound and, and the Graph and these other projects, none of those were showing. This is like pre-summer, uh, summer of DeFi was pre-NFT explosion, so there was no track record. Um, and so it was gonna be a hard pitch for me to start my business if it was a pure kind of crypto native fund. Um, as it turns out, those things, it's kind of silly because you invest with a long time horizon. And mm -hmm. so you're like, it's this chicken and egg of saying like, hey, I think we're doing um, really great work on the investment side and finding great companies, but um, but I don't have like a lot to show for it yet. And so, um, yeah, I guess I guess like now you you kind of reach a point in your career where you have enough credibility with with your investors in my case LPs to to kind of dictate how you spend your time and 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 what you invest in. But it definitely took me a while to get to that point. And so, um, yeah, and then just in terms of of the market, I think we all know like two thousand eighteen and two thousand nineteen were really tough time periods um, across the board for founders, um, uh, investors, like a lot of, there were a lot of funds that went out of business at that time. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was, I think, just like, like keeping your eye on the ball and continuing to invest was important, but also um, being patient with your investments and kind of like helping your founders stay, um, I guess, like, optimistic um mm -hmm. because there were there were some pretty dark time periods and um most of those companies i mentioned almost every company i invested in in 2016 and 17 did some form of a bridge round where um right. like you weren't sure if they were going to be able to raise the next round um and so for founders is you know it was way harder on founders than it was for vcs to be clear because they're the ones who have to wake up and they only have like one company they're working on every day. Mm -hmm. um, but I think across the board, everybody was just waiting for for something to happen that was beyond kind of like store of value. Um, and, you know, with Summer DeFi, I feel like that was like just so exciting from, hey, like, like we finally have some like consumer applications, although it was like a very like small subset of people who were participating in DeFi, it was still like, really exciting and then I think NFTs were just like the cultural breakthrough that crypto needed to reach the mainstream and um, you know I was I woke up this morning I was reading like everybody who launched an NFT project last week like Shaq released an NFT project last week yeah. and now he's <laughs> he's Shaq.eth um, and you just sort of like I, I feel like some people take for granted that, that crypto is is pretty mainstream at this point like it's a part of culture and a really profound way and um, it's almost like we're waiting for crypto to become like a larger part of the world but it's already h hugely important um, and I think what what ENS not to keep on uh, bringing us back to ENS <laughs> but I think it's really helped though because you um, it's so front and center on Twitter obviously which is mm -hmm. um, to me like the the most important social platform for for kind of like everyday human um, connection and when you see someone like Shaq uh Shaq.eth like that's that's like a huge huge decision on his part to to kind of like identify with crypto and um and then when you when you kind of like go even a layer down like Shaq saying hey you can see everything that's on chain uh like literally here's my my on-chain bank account and feel free to to follow everything I do um, yeah. And so this like social money thesis is finally becoming um, a real thing, which I also think we take for granted, like in 2016 and 17, you did not want to share your wallet publicly. Like mm -hmm. it was just like a frightening thing. And now um, uh, people are basically open sourcing their bank accounts with the world, um, which is, I think, really profound. And then you, you kind of consider what applications can, what new applications will be built um, now that people are open sourcing their on-chain activity, it's it's going to be just a, an explosion of social consumer applications um, that have not been built yet. So, 
Yeah, I'm really excited about those social consumer apps because, uh, yeah, I guess the um, it's almost like a wave, like this the kind of traditional now social media um, apps that we kind of experience day to day over the last ten years. It's kind of it feels like the waves like kind of almost like washed out. We're like ready for the next thing, <laughs> and <laughs> and so I am really interested to see what those are. I wonder in terms of investing in crypto compared to just investing in tech, this idea of bull markets and bear markets, and you know trying to raise being conscious that we're still at the point where you know it's not flat. There are ups and downs, and so how in your experience has that been different and. Um, what is kind of your expectation in terms of, you know, now I feel like 2021 has been an incredible bear market, um, yeah. I mean, bull market, I think when, I think it's like April, May, when we like thought it was going to be a bear and then it just like kept going um, and bounced <laughs> back. And so, yeah, compared to say 2017, where that, that bull market, I think only lasted a few months. And so this feels really wild, but kind of on the back of, you know, $50 million uh, fun for with page two how are you thinking about maybe even just like the next six to 12 months yeah i think um so i guess i'll start by just like the ecosystem's so big now that mm -hmm. i remember when i started investing in crypto in like 2016 you just like you could cover everything right because there was so um i guess like so few categories at the time um mainly it was like layer one and just like infrastructure and very kind of like um uh, like not definitely n there were no consumer applications at the time and mm -hmm. so now I think as an investor it's really becoming important to almost like web 2 you have investors who cover like B2B SaaS um, you have investors who cover healthcare consumer um, you almost need to like redefine what verticals are within web 3 and be really thoughtful about how you um, how you spend your time and, and, and what you focus on so part of um, I guess like the challenge of any of any investors coming up with beliefs or thesis statements that are actually original and um and so we're i feel like we've done a really um great job of like being everywhere in, in web3 i guess in the mm -hmm. past like year especially um like at every conference um kind of like around the table for every investment conversation but um we're kind of leaning into the idea that now the ecosystem, the ecosystem is big enough where you need to really start to identify what you care about and what you believe um, will be the best use of your time and dollars. And so, um, and you can look back on kind of like, like if, if every, if I'd invest in every layer one in 2016, 17, and just yeah. blindly invested, um, like I, I would probably not need to work anymore. Um, <laughs> and then you look at like, you look at like multi-coin with, Solana, like, like the idea that like, um, they picked an ecosystem to invest in. And so, yeah, I guess we're trying to really, um, pick and choose our spots. The ups and downs of crypto for, for me, we invest, we're primarily first check investors. So it's, um, I just approach every investment as, um, any other early stage investment. So you're signing up to partner with the founder for, um, a very long period of time. And so it's, not um, if you think about the ups and downs of any early stage company, they're just as profound. It's just there's not like a public, like a publicly traded uh, token or sc like scoreboard for how that that might be doing. Even like things like Dune Analytics are pretty profound because that's like open sourcing every startup's um, yeah. internal dashboards for the world to see. So um, so there is like this there's a different feeling where like the momentums, I guess, are more like publicly known. Um, mm -hmm. And the sentiment is louder online. But as an investor, if you're kind of trying to be a, a long term capital partner and thinking of your career and in, in your reputation with a longer time horizon, um, I don't think you should act any different. And I think investors who um, especially like early investors who sell tokens early or do things that are um, potentially harmful to to founders um, and the projects will be I guess over time like that that will be um, more more shared and whether it's like amongst founder communities or even publicly shared like you can track these things yeah. pretty easily um, and so we're 
like very much align with founders that we want to be with their projects for the long term. Yeah, that's um, that's a really interesting dynamic of Web3, which is like this visibility uh, potentially for VCs and investors with the projects and kind of the, the tokens that they have. Uh, I think on June Analytics there is, yeah, well, June Analytics is really incredible. I know like when I first discovered um, June Analytics, I know there is a dashboard like company in Web2 and I was so excited when you can make, <laughs> a company can make their dashboard public. And it was so interesting to see that stuff, but you know, so few companies would opt to do that. Um, but yeah. Web3, you're just like, okay, cool. I'm just going to go to June. Someone's probably made a dashboard on this protocol or this project and you can just access it and it's it's really incredible. But yeah, I there's an well ENS. Into... There's an ENS dashboard, which I'm sure you guys have seen. Yes, it's <laughs> ENS dashboard, which we use all the time. Actually, I think our homepage stats pull, or we get the stats from uh, Makoto's June Analytics. Isn't that crazy? So, yeah. You have somebody uh, in the community building your analytics for you, and oh, Makoto's on our public. team. <laughs> but but I, I think it's, it's just it's pretty wild. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's available well. for everybody to see. Uh, with the airdrop, someone built a, a June Analytics, like a really incredible June Analytics dashboard for that. And I can't, it'd be really interesting to know how many hits that analytics dashboard got, like in the two weeks after the drop. And it was such a service, like <laughs> I was kind of constantly um, using it to see how many people had claimed and things like that and um, trying to manage, you know, the Discord the Discord overwhelm, but uh, yeah, it was really, it's really interesting. So in terms of, I guess, like VCs and investing, there's this idea that like capital is cheap now in Web3 because we've kind of like turned this corner and it's it's kind of cool and alluring and hip to be here. And, uh, and so just bringing capital to the table is not enough. And I know with Chapter 1 and kind of obviously with your experience at Tinder that you are a builder. And so how do you think about... I guess, partnering with the projects and the founders that you're working with and coming to the table like with capital, but also with a lot of skills and utility and kind of that ability to, it really seems like a partnership, right? Is that how yeah. you think about it? it? It is. I mean, we had probably like the good fortune of starting a fund um, in 2000. It started in 2017, but really like we started to build the team in 2021. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think this would be hard to pull off if you were just like a legacy venture fund because you have so much built in kind of like operational debt. But um, we decided to create our team in the same way you'd start a startup um, by identifying like what we want our product to be um, mm -hmm. with the idea that our customers are Web3 founders. And so we then we looked a lot just at the, I guess like the market of other um, crypto funds and, and other investors and um, and we saw like we saw a gap in, well I guess the first thing the first thing is we saw um, what we believe like the major problem statement of crypto now is that it's just not like usable enough for the mass market, and then that aligned directly with like what our backgrounds have been in product and design. Um, and then we started to think, I guess, from first principles about what what Web3 founders need that's different from Web2. And if you were to build, um, I guess, like a venture fund from scratch without any like concepts of, of like mm -hmm. institutional hierarchy within a venture fund. So most venture funds have like associates and principals and VPs and they have like partners. Um, we just didn't want to do any of that. It, it like wasn't. If you're building a product for founders, like none of that would matter. And so we mm -hmm. didn't want that to matter for us. Um, and then we thought about how, kind of how you can scale, like helping founders with product and design. And we looked, I guess, at, at what a lot of venture funds had done. Like they, they provide pretty broad help. Like a founder comes to them and they kind of they give strategic help or, or connect them with people. And we really wanted to be a bit more hands-on um, than that and, and I guess hands-on as much as like the teams need so some teams need um, a lot more help than others and um, we ended up hiring a couple people but um, one of our first hires was one of the first PMs um, from the 
blockchain team at Facebook. Um, we hired the lead designer on um, on the creator team at Stripe. And so, um, and then we've we've continued to hire, just like really, we're hiring a community lead soon who's been um, like really influential within DAO governance, and so like really understands like the the politics behind managing um, a DAO and how you build a community um, in a in a kind of healthy, productive way. But um, what we've been doing is we do um, design. I guess you could call it like design sprints as a service for founders. And so you, um, there's like this zero to one product phase where um, like you're not worried, I guess as a, as a founding team, like you can kind of overlook the, like the design details needed to go to product, go to market with like a really polished product. Mm -hmm. And so we spend, um, and we just did this last week, we spend a few days with each team just identifying their most important, um, product or design challenge. And then we kind of go, um, work with them. And at the end of it, you have like real work that you've accomplished. So, um, we haven't publicly said this because we think it's like two on the nose, but, uh, it's like proof of work as a VC would be <laughs> like, you're actually doing work with founders. Um, and you're giving them like something tangible. So even like, like it could be like, like your first logo or your brand identity, it could be your landing page, it could be like your core, your like your actual core product. But um, we think it's pretty powerful if you can actually like hand um, a founder or something that you've done together, as opposed to just giving like really high level strategic advice. Um, and so that's kind of how we built chapter one. And we think we think there's a lot of great Web3 funds who are doing different things around liquidity or um, uh, tokenomics or kind of different parts of the stack, but we think we're um, pretty uniquely positioned to, to kind of like do the product and design uh, as a service very well. Um, and so that's that's how we're building our team. Yeah, that's really exciting because I know that constantly we talk about how the UX of crypto apps is a, a real pain point, especially for, actually for lots of different kind of segments of the market. And so I'm, I'm really excited about kind of seeing the influence of chapter one uh, across Web3 um, going into 2022. And so in terms of what you, like what really excites you about Web3 and thinking more about these kind of like areas that, you know, if you can't invest in like every single layer one um, or now layer two, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what it's it's funny do you like get to the point where you're like wait that was 2016 17 if i just done that w now i should just do this or <laughs> do you like know. To resist that urge? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it seems so long ago too which is pretty crazy like crypto years are like like every year must be like 20 years in crypto years um yeah but yeah <laughs> it it is a lot it's kind of i think it's kind of amazing because the contrast of how much life can be lived in a couple of months of being in crypto really uh kind of made me look back at like the last 10 years of my life and think like wow i <laughs> i probably could have squeezed like a lot more life out of that decade compared to like <laughs> the, the the 10 months that i've been in web3 and I feel, like you said it, I feel like you know 10 months equals like kind of at least 10 years um in terms of I don't know, just like the experience, the exposure to people, like everything seems to come at you a lot faster. Uh, so yeah, in terms of like, just like areas within Web3 that really excite you, that you're really focused on, what sort of things are you thinking about? Yeah, I think um, there's been a few things, but obviously social has been a big, mm -hmm. um, like I don't think there's a Web3 native graph that has been created yet. Um, it could be a protocol that um, can be broadly adopted by many different um social applications and that might actually end up being ENS. So we'll see. Um, but I'm really interested, um, in, in, in just like what a web three social graph will look like. Um, mm -hmm. I've been in interested just for a long time in this idea that like fi finance to me has been the last category, um, that hasn't been made social yet. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it is now, but like the whole multiplayer money, um, kind of squad wealth thesis has been just really exciting to, to see that play out. Um, it kind of reminds me of dating in like 2015 where you, like I remember when I used to tell friends I'd use dating apps 
um, they would look at me like something was wrong with me. And now it's just like everybody, everybody uses dating apps. Um, but it's kind of this similar, I think, for, for finance. Um, this idea, like, why would you not want to um, invest with your friends? And why would you not want to um, create DAOs or mini squads to go make money together? Like, that's just a really exciting um, social activity that's emerged in the past couple of years. Um, I'm really excited about mobile crypto. So... I think when you look at the apps on your phone, um, most most kind of most of my Web three activity still happens on the web, and so um, I just think like it's so obvious that over the next couple of years there's going to be um, really great mobile experiences that are built, um, and that will help with retention and engagement and everything else. Um, and then, yeah, I think just broadly, like to me, identity is is really interesting. It's why I've become so involved with ENS, um, and I'm just broad like ENS is one part of it. But I'm I'm just really excited about the idea that um, we finally will have on chain identities that are portable um, and from a usability perspective, like not having to create a profile for every single mm-hmm. product I sign up for is just really powerful. Um, and having that not own, like Facebook login and Facebook connect, um, I think we're the first version of this, but, um, I think we can all agree that we would rather not have Facebook being the ones who, um, control our, our identity. And so, um, yeah, just, I, th- I think there's going just going to be so many powerful new use cases that emerge from, from just like that idea alone that we're really excited about. Yeah. I think that of this idea of signing with ethereum and a portable web3 username is so it so fundamentally changes our experience but it does it in such a subtle way because you know when you sign up for something you do it and you don't really (laughs) it's a pain it's a pain but you just like do it anyway and then you kind of forget about it uh but you know i've just started kind of using sign with ethereum on some of the platforms that have integrated it already and it feels really great and again i just like don't know if it's like a timing thing in terms of usernames and passwords just like this concept of money like we didn't know what money was until like the fed started just like printing money (laughs) um at the start of the pandemic and we're like wait stop what um and so i think now i feel like it's real aversion when people like when platforms ask me for my address like or you know different things like that and i'm like wait but i'm just signing up to this (laughs) to this (laughs) thing and like why do you need to know where i live uh and so, yeah, just this idea also that our identities are linked to our wallets. And I think this ties into what you're thinking about, yeah. like kind of squad wealth. And what does that mean when money is connected to, to everything and it becomes really social and public and, and things like that? It seems like such a shift from even just this idea of bank accounts, right, which is that they're really private. It's like, you know, money's not something that we talk about. Um, so, yeah, I think the social consumer space in that area is really exciting and i wonder just in terms of you know DAOs and uh projects with tokens and kind of things like that that are really you know web3 native how what has kind of been your take on the last 12 months in particular where you know DAOs are seen to really take off and um i know that you're interested in lots of say DAO tooling and infrastructure projects yeah so how do you think about that space I think um, it's probably the most exciting uh, part of the space today um, because there's so much creativity and um, it's almost like watching like an improv show right now. Like you see a really good DAO and someone else creates like like a really exciting DAO the next day in response. And um, I think I think like the as an investor, I'm kind of trying to identify um, communities that want to be. I guess like want to really like build product has been a big thing for me. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, like Jess at C camp, I think we've had some really good conversations about like community before product um, being the new mm-hmm. path and um, kind of like, like the minimum viable community thesis. But um, like party DAO is, is, is an obvious one where like they've just managed to ship really great products. Um, I think to me, like, the communities, DAO communities that I think are most exciting are ones that have a, a real purpose beyond just like, like kind of like hyping up a, a theme or 
a concept. So even Constitution DAO was interesting because it was like this multiplayer money, squad wealth idea of like, mm-hmm. hey, we're all going to come together and buy something um, that's really meaningful to us um, and has cultural value. I think that was that was interesting. The, um, the tooling piece has been, I think for me as like a former VP of product who knows mm-hmm. how... Um, I guess like hard it is to, to, to coordinate actions. Um, we just invested in, um, Wonderverse, which is kind of like, it's like a DAO. It's like, sorry, it's like a web three Asana where DAOs can really easily, um, create kind of like an open task board and there's financial incentives, um, paired to each task that you can complete, but you can imagine how, um, how if this existed during kind of like the open source era of the kind of mm-hmm. like the 2010 to 2016 when open source didn't have a real good business model, like it's really powerful if you can go um, contribute code or um, or anything else and just get paid in real time for that task. And so, yeah, I guess I'm really interested in, in kind of like DAO tooling that combines um, kind of like task management with, with the actual payments. Um, so people can instantaneously get paid for their work around the world. And I think on a deeper level like this will enable ev- anyone around the world with technical skills or creative skills to, to make money um, in a way that I think is better for the creator than like in Upwork or kind of like these these like these like web two kind of like job boards. Um, I, I just think it's like a it's a better model. And so um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But the, yeah. the kind of the the DAO, the DAO space I think is also really interesting from a um, like investment DAOs we invested in Syndicate Protocol um, and yeah I'm kind of I kind of wake up some days being like is venture capital going to um, uh, exist in twenty years because this it's just such an exciting time to, uh, seeing how quickly people can can coordinate their their money and their um, uh, kind of like their their energy. Yeah. I wonder as well, kind of being VP of product and you were in charge of revenue, right? At Tinder. That's right. And so yeah. thinking about making money and then kind of shifting to web three, where a lot of the infrastructure, you know, ENS is an open source public good. So there, it's funny, I was actually thinking about this. So ENS charges registration fees to, um, register in the NS name but yeah. actually it's just an anti-civil mechanism to deter squatting and if you know we found a way to make sure that um, people were able to get a name without charging a fee then we would probably do that but at the moment we can't do that so that's why the fees exist it looks like a business model but it's actually not but it, yeah. it is kind of based on you know web 2 standards and so thinking about you know, and that's, I, f- I feel like, you know, ENS has the best case scenario in that sense that there is like some income. But thinking about Web3 and especially this idea of public goods or just like protocols in general that don't have kind of a traditional business model in the way that we're used to thinking about it. How do you, as someone who has this lens from Web2, where, you know, it's like really easy, you're like, okay, this is my, not, it's not easy actually, but it's like, it's more evident, which is like, this is my customer, this is a product or service I'm providing, and this is like where we get to with an outcome yeah. with revenue. <laughs> how do you think about how to reconcile like the value transfer and value capture with Web3? Yeah. No, it's, um, it was funny when I first saw ENS, I, I was like, I think I asked um, whether there was some like recurring annual payment because mm-hmm. my mind is so, was so like <laughs> trained to, uh, to have recurring revenue and subscriptions. Um, mm-hmm. And then kind of looking at, at, at the business models of Web3, I think for something like ENS specifically, you're better served just trying to achieve, I guess, like escape velocity in terms of adoption and becoming mm-hmm become like if your, your mission really is to become, um, the identity layer of web three. And if you have a business model that prevents that from happening because you're focused on near term value capture, um, it's kind of antithetical to your mission. I've always believed that if you have, if you get to, to, to be in a position where you have any network effects, like you can, 
you can monetize later and um you know obviously i don't know if that's what the ultimate like end state is for ens or any other project but um i would first focus on just making sure you have a product that's accessible to as many people as possible and then there will always be some subset of users in especially in consumer products that is willing to to pay so for tinder specifically like we were trying to 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 get to the point where 10 percent of our our cut our users were paying customers um but there were 90 percent of, of people around the world who could use tinder for free and that was really important to us because we needed network effects to create a marketplace that that would be useful to people um mm -hmm. for stuff like ens i just think it's so obvious like if you become the identity layer of the web3 internet um you will have so many opportunities to monetize down the road and it's not like it's not saying that um uh like you should never think about monetization it's just like there's a more important mission right now which is um how do we get every wallet to to attach um uh ens or, or anyone who's interested in identity um should have ens or some other identity um attached to their their wallet and so that's that's kind of like the near term but um there are some web3 business models that just monetize really well because everything's like pretty transactional um in terms of like the early use cases so i think i read that um OpenSea is going to like their revenue to OpenSea this year is over 500 million dollars um yeah it was some crazy number and um, um and that's like in a year so where they really, really like had product market fit um and then you look at DeFi projects like it's pretty it's a pretty self-explanatory business model in most cases. Um, so yeah, I think what I ask more though, is just like, what should, like what would benefit from having investors um, and what should actually be just like a, a free public good. And I think that there's so many debates about this on Twitter right now that it's kind of exhausting, mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> yeah. but <laughs> you know, I think, I think there's a role for, for both in, in, in the world and, um, and so I try not to take like a, a side on this um, or too strong of a side. Yeah, I wonder in terms of ENS and the DAO launch and, and things like that, kind of having been in the space and know, knowing about ENS, did you see that coming? And like, what was your reaction to it? <laughs> um, I don't think I saw it coming. I wouldn't say, um, yeah, it was, it was surprising. I think what was so exciting to me was that, um, if you believe that identity will have uh, a profound impact on web, web three, all of us could participate in kind of like being a part of the future. Um, and you almost feel like, um, you're a team member when you participate in DAO governance, like you're, you're not a full-time core contributor, but you have this like emotional connection to the project. Um, and so for me, I just, I, I personally thought it'd be really cool to be part of, um, that, exploration process that will probably take um you know decades potentially like hope hopefully we'll be on here in like 2050 saying that everyone has an ens wallet um or some form of identity attached to their their wallets um but yeah i think um i didn't see it coming i think what was really cool was just to see um when you have when you're participating in governance you um like my engagement with a product or a project has never been, um, I guess like this strong for no, like there's no financial reason I'm doing this really. Um, mm -hmm. because I'm not like on salary. I don't, uh, have like an outsized amount of ENS, uh, tokens. It's just like being a part of this, um, group of people who care about identity is just a really cool, um, I guess it's like a really cool part of my day where I don't actually have to like think about it as being work. It's just kind of like a place to nerd out and, and kind of like, like not worry about, um, everything else. Um, so I think it's, it kind of convinced me, um, cause I haven't participated in governance, um, mm -hmm. uh, to date in this form that, um, it convinced me of how powerful it can be just as like, like just to break it down web two terms, like just as, just in terms of like retention and attention, like, um, you keep people really engaged. And, and so, 
Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. I um, I put on Twitter yesterday, and it kind of got a reaction of like thinking about how you can how you can like create that that like that energy that um, that we all felt, I guess, when ENS went live, and this could be any mm-hmm. DAO, but kind of like that airdrop energy, how you can keep that mm-hmm. going um, for a long period of time. And so I'm not I'm not sure if we've like discovered like the end state for airdrops in terms of being these like kind of like launch events almost, um, mm-hmm. but how you can kind of like um, do that on a more continuous basis. And, and so, um, but yeah, I'm, 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 I'm pumped. I'm also really excited um, about the working groups and um, seeing how DAOs can like scale in terms of, of being productive, but also having people opt in to where their most interest in where they can provide the most value. Um, yeah. And so, I wonder in yeah, terms of, yeah. <laughs> in terms of like a, a company, this idea that, you know, everyone, everyone goes through a hiring process and uh, it's, you know, there's like a job description and it's quite elaborate. I would say like the recruitment process in most companies to this idea of having a DAO, which is op- like completely open. You can drop into the governance forum or the discord server and just like start engaging and talking. How, like how wild does that feel in terms of a comparison and and like how do you think that will play out and I don't know it almost like makes you wonder about the structures and the kind of processes and systems that we have in place and whether you know the outcomes that we get to I guess this is like a completely alternative take in terms of you know what does it look like to build a community to build product um to build infrastructure whatever it is um and to do it in an open way where people can just walk in the door. How does that end up? <laughs> yeah, I think um, there's like this tension between like needing to get things done. And so just like mm-hmm. having um, having a mission and knowing um, like there should be some core group of people who, who can kind of like push the project forward on a, a day-to-day basis while also being really um, community focused and and having, I guess, like a uh, uh, the right mechanics to give everybody a voice, and so mm-hmm. um, I think working groups are a really good way to achieve that. And um, I'm also like I'm I'm constantly kind of questioning like the onboarding challenge in, in DAOs is something mm-hmm. that hasn't quite been solved. So like when I I'm like bought into identity ENS, like I I'm already a part. Of, but if someone um, hops into uh, I guess like like learns about Web three today and then learns about ENS in a month. Um, how do they kind of become, um, I guess like like a productive member of the of the DAO um, with without feeling like imposter syndrome or um, and so I'm I'm really excited about like that piece of uh, solving that piece too because I think we all know if you're building a product right like onboarding is always the top of the funnel. And you need to have um, uh, a really clear, I guess, like in social, you need to give like users a chance to win really quickly because mm-hmm. that's how they feel like the product works for them. And so I'm curious, like in DAOs, how you give community members that same feeling like, wow, I just joined a DAO and I, I did something um, impactful or I, I made my first contribution um, mm-hmm. um, and, and kind of like that that piece I think I'm really excited to, to solve. Um, not just for ENS, I think it, this is important for every every DAO, right? Um, yeah, uh, we've, absolutely. Because we've all joined a DAOs and you just sort of like look around in the Discord and you're like, <laughs> what, what do I do? <laughs> I remember being in, in a Discord server and people saying, oh, you just have to engage and, and contribute. And I was like, I don't, I don't know how to do that um, right now when you just like jump in and you're fresh and you kind of like barely know the project and you you certainly don't know what kind of value you can add. Um, so I think definitely in terms of kind of really laying out paths so people have an idea of, um, uh, yeah, just like what, not having to figure out everything um, and just kind of providing a bit of scaffolding for engagement and contribution, I think is really important. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to kind of do that and think about that. And I'm grateful that I feel like we've kind of got a head start with ENS and how engaged, um, com- you know, community members are. And also this 
really interesting phenomenon that I've experienced in the last two months, which is that kind of because of the value of the airdrop, the value of the responsibility that people airdropped, uh, a lot of people just feel like they want to contribute and they kind of, um, they want to engage without expectation, but, you know, just because they feel like you said, like they're part of something and they're interested in it. And so that's been really wild for me because I'm kind of, the way that I think about it is, is that, oh my gosh, someone is contributing value. I have to, you know, how do I communicate to them that I see them and that yeah. they are appreciated? And uh, but then kind of, yeah, just balancing that with the fact that there was like an airdrop in the past. There's like a, hopefully DAO working groups in the future. And then I'm just like kind of trying to bridge this space. Um, so I'm really excited about January. I think we have steward nominations opening next week and then uh, an election, which will be... Uh, a week long or five days long and then stewards will take their place in the working groups on the 16th of jan at which point oh, cool. um, hopefully we'll have lots of requests for subgroups and, and things to get to get going and i know in the forum you said you're interested in things like treasury management and stuff like that and i wonder just in terms of like managing capital like usd fiat capital and how you think about dow treasuries what sort of stuff are you thinking about yeah I, i'm um i guess like uh First off, like in working groups, I was actually most excited to do, to take a role that um, was outside of my day to day, like what I do oh, right. at Chapter One. Um, or everyone's like, like J please just do the do the money stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, no, I was thinking like there's. I think there was a product working group that was um, proposed, mm-hmm. um, or at least I, I think I read that. But um, I haven't I haven't actually participated in Treasury management in a DAO before, so I was kind of thinking of it as being just a really cool. Um, mm-hmm. way to learn um, and to contribute. And so um, I have looked at a lot of DAO treasury management products and, and, and pitches. Um, I'm particularly interested in how like DAO to DAO um, treasury collaboration and how that works so you can um, support other DAOs um, and kind of build partnerships almost like you would. Um, so it's kind of like a combination of in a web two of like CFO, VP of finance functions paired with like, like business development, I guess for, for lack of a better word. Um, and so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see how that plays out. Of, um, like Llama is a good example, I think in the community mm-hmm. um, of a protocol exploring this, but um, I just think we're gonna see this explosion of DAOs um, supporting each other and providing services for each other and um, thinking in terms of how that might help ENS in terms of achieving its mission faster. I think, I don't know how big your core team is right now, but it's still probably a, a fairly small core team. And so it's like, how do you, how do you leverage the rest of the internet and every other DAO who can provide value for ENS to, to kind of achieve its mission? Well, I think the cool part is ENS probably doesn't need to have like a, a core team or this massive team that looks like a, like if you're building a web two identity team, you probably mm-hmm. have to have like thousands of employees, right? And so when oh I my think gosh, of I, tre- didn't, I did not think you were gonna say thousands. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe I know one in web two that it's a startup and they have four hundred employees and they as far as I know don't mm-hmm. have like um, that much product out in the world yet. And so um, to think that you got this far with eight people, um, I think the treasury's job is to try and um, expand your, um, I guess, like your your capabilities without um, mm-hmm. without kind of like staffing the core team um, to be like a web two size. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of like that's how I'm I'm thinking of it. But I'd be curious how mm-hmm. you think about it. Um, and maybe I'm thinking about this completely wrong, so I'm, I'm actually like... No, I, I, th- uh, I yeah. think I think about it in a similar way, which is yeah. that there is, like, the core team is kind of the smallest possible unit, and then the DAO is an opportunity for us to, like, really scale in terms of community involvement and, um, and using the, yeah, the talents of contributors to, and other DAOs and, you know, other communities to to build out i just think like a more resilient network of of engaged people 
who are contributing to uh, to ENS. And so that's definitely how I think about it. And like I said, I, I'm really excited. I feel like there's this kind of, there's like the core team and then there's the circle of contributors who are really active in Discord on the governance forum. And I'm kind of, I almost think about it like in, in waves or in tiers, which is that for me as community manager, I just want to kind of create space so that those people are kind of set and feel yeah. like they kind of know where they're at and that's sorted and then kind of like going further out from there and um yeah I, I think that it's a it's a huge opportunity and ENS is like really particularly well positioned to uh to experiment with that I think as well just because the core team you know with Nick um and I guess like the devs that we have in the team focusing on the protocol it means that I think it relieves a lot of pressure for the community in terms of not having to say focus on the actual protocol and just really focusing I think the ENS ecosystem working group is going to be really insane and I'm, I'm really excited about that uh and so yeah I, I think that uh I don't know I'm, I'm excited to do like a recap in like six or 12 months and be like yeah. wow can you believe that working groups did this <laughs> I think the coolest part about all, all this is it's all um it's all basically an experiment that you're running mm -hmm. every day and you're improvising, as I said. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's like very iterative um, community and software development, which, um, and, and those two things are equally important now. Um, mm -hmm. Like I remember when I first started in, in startups and I won't age myself, but many years ago, um, <laughs> it was like, because I worked on a community team um, before I worked on product teams and mm -hmm. we were always like, kind of one step behind them in terms of, of like how we were positioned within the organization. Um, mm -hmm. It was like, hey, like the product team is doing this and they're shipping this and like, how can the community team support them? And mm -hmm. um, now the kind of like product and community are, I think, have achieved like equal um, importance within, within Web3. And some would argue community is actually way more important than products. So um i i think i don't think we need to like assign a, a level of importance to either one they're just like both very important and um so it's just really cool to see to see you iterate um uh on how this will all work and, and scale and um yeah for me that's really exciting yeah i wonder just to wrap up in terms of your kind of looking back on the we have to do like a little bit of a, a retrospective given that it's like the last few days of the year and 2021 has been insane has this been like one of the best years for you in terms of like life and work and just like everything <laughs> that's going on um it's it's really weird for me personally because like i feel like uh i'm really bad at compartmentalizing anything so like actually you know my personal identity and um you know how i am and then what i work on it just like Ugh, I'm really bad at this, but I am like a hundred percent of me all the time. So uh, it's really hard for me to like switch off and especially with yeah. Web3, it's, it's so engaging and kind of uh, it bleeds into every area of life, which this year has been really good. Um, and so, but I wonder what it's been like for you. Yeah, I would say it's been for me the best year of my professional life, largely because um, like I've turned this corner at chapter one specifically like around this idea of building a team and building mm -hmm. um, something different and new um, mm -hmm. before it was just myself. And there was like this solo GP wave, which is still a thing. But um, for me personally, I decided like this would all be a lot more fun if I was doing it with friends, like investing with friends as uh, as like one of our theses. Like I wanted to bring that to chapter one too. And then... Um, I just think of Web3 as being this amazing community of um, curious, optimistic people who um, who are really open to, to kind of like new friendships. I, I, I think this year, I don't know if you feel this way, but I've made more like internet friends who have become real life friends than any point in my life. And, um, and the people I've met are just like, every walk of life it could be artists um it could be founders just like literally i had a call last week with um uh in anon and he didn't even show his face on the call and we're friends um he even agreed <laughs> he agreed to even meet in person uh one day and so 
like they don't even have to be real people. Like I guess like back to ENS, like the identities don't even matter, right? They're just like people who are interesting and kind of capture your um, attention online. And so from that perspective, it's been awesome. I think I do think a lot about um, like this all being a marathon and so trying to mm-hmm. um, trying to also like maintain every aspect of my life that matters beyond um, Web3 and crypto has been I oh think my we'll gosh, be like, I should have, yeah, yeah. I should have started the podcast with this. Like, please tell, tell me your tips yeah. of how you ma- how you maintain balance. Is it? But seriously, is there anything that you yeah. do to kind of just like, for me, it's walking. Like I've realized that if I don't go on my morning walk, uh, my day slash life slash brain falls apart. Uh, but for you, like, are there any things that kind of just like at the top of your list in terms of stuff here? I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like I need to work out in the morning or go do something mm-hmm. productive. Um, I'm making a New Year's resolution to not look at my phone um, in bed when I wake up in the morning because that's that's okay. like the ultimate like internet trap. Um, yeah. And but I think it's just like having um, parts of your life that are very clearly, um, uh, I guess like like marked off in, in your calendar for non non Web three non crypto um, mm-hmm. uh, work and actually doing those. So like. I love um, playing sports. I love like being active, and that's kind of my break. And um, yeah, I I kind of at times worry that um, the space is just like so like it's it's like the ultimate video game. Like there's always like another level mm-hmm. you can play, and yes. um, you need to like turn off the the TV every once in a while and go um, go live your life. So I'm trying to get better at that, um, and. I say this after having like woken up this morning early and and like read a million articles um, while I'm on vacation. So I'm clearly not doing a good job of it. But, uh, you know, we all work in progress, right? Yeah. No, I think that uh, there are lots of people on this boat and it's really hard to uh, maintain balance when you feel like there is so much opportunity and that to step away would result in, in yeah missed opportunities whether it is you know dropping your ens name on a twitter thread that leads <laughs> to like some dow that drops a poet i mean you know it's like it happens <laughs> all the time <laughs> and it sounds outrageous to say it it sounds weird to say it out loud i guess i like never talk about like the stuff that we're doing or the things that happen you, you know because you're in it and so you you never like have this third person perspective of it and you're like what yeah. is happening um but yeah i i'm kind of excited for I think as well, I think this is like the potential with DAOs and kind of creating more structure around the way that we engage as communities is to have that idea of a, a bit of lead, leadership and culture setting in terms of, you know, what is healthy and sustainable. And this is definitely a marathon. Um, Jeff is on our team and has been uh, at ENS since, you know, basically the beginning. He ha- has said to me like a couple of times in the last month, like it's a marathon, not a sprint. And like what I'm yeah. doing is not sustainable. And, uh, I know he's right, and I think hopefully I'll, I'll use the new year to kind of just like commit to also maybe better sleeping habits would be a good. <laughs> <But yeah. laughs> I think that's important too. But uh, <laughs> no, it means you you love your job, you love the space, and um, and you love the community that you're working with. So um, I definitely feel the same way. But um, yeah, I guess we all we can all make our resolutions. I'd be curious um, to see kind of more of the communities. ENS community's resolutions, um, but, uh, really but no, definitely, <laughs> it'd be kind of fun. <laughs> okay, I, we have to like tweet that out um, <laughs> and, and the next couple of days, let's do that. Uh, oh, do you know what would be so interesting? Because you can add any text record to an ENS name. This would be mortifying. No one do this. <laughs> but, <laughs> but because you could add any text record to your ENS name, you could like set your resolutions and add it as a text record to your ENS <laughs> name. And then people could every time that they <laughs> went and looked you Look up. Look at your profile. Um, <laughs> and they could be like, oh, I wonder if they, they're still sticking to that user resolution that they set. Um, that is oh hilarious. Oh my gosh, how mortifying. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank it. you so much, Jeff. No, this is great. A. I really appreciate it. And I'm so excited. Um, to you know, see you involved with the ENS DAO and the working groups, and yeah. Thank you so much. This is great, and um, yeah, I'll see you next year. 